watch and discuss the horrific, the obscure, and the flat-out strange from the other side of cinema. I'm Mark Dickerson. And I'm Jeremy Fink. And today is the second episode in our series Flash in the Can, the one-hit wonders of cult cinema. Today we'll be discussing 1973's The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man is a 1973 film directed by Robin Hardy that follows Sergeant Howie, played by Edward Woodward, as he arrives on a small Scottish island to investigate the report of a missing child. A conservative Christian, the policeman observes the resident's frivolous sexual displays and strange pagan rituals, particularly the temptations of Willow, played by Britt Eklund, daughter of the island magistrate, Lord Somerset, Lord Somersill, Christopher Lee. The more Sergeant Howie learns about the Islanders' strange practices, the closer he gets to tracking down the missing child. Mm-hmm. Lots of debauchery and mm-hmm. nudity. <laughs> yes. And just a note, as we dig in here, this is the 1973 The Wicker Man, not to oh, be yes. confused with the 2006 The Wicker <laughs> Man starring Nicolas Cage, nor uh-huh. The Wicker Tree, um, which was actually directed by the same record by the same yeah. director and came out in 2011. That's kind of a companion piece from what I understand. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Me neither. Um, um, but we will touch on that, yeah, when we're discussing, uh, you know, behind the scenes. But stuff. today we are focused yeah. on the 1973, the Wicker yes. Man. It's the non Nicolas Cage one. <laughs> no um, bees. No bees <laughs> yeah. in this movie. No bees. <laughs> no memes, uh, <laughs> as far as I know, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, Jeremy, so this um, is your first time seeing this film, mm-hmm. The Wicker Man. And I had only seen it once before, I believe. And. But it's very memorable, this film, mm-hmm. and uh, with some chilling and pretty haunting and some flat out bizarre imagery as well. Um, and lots of music, which I had forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Um, I, this is kind of a musical. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. A little bit. A little yeah. bit. So, there, are, there are a few musical scenes. Yeah. So what did you think about, uh, well, the movie itself and the music? Um, so the movie itself, I'm just going to come out and say it straight up. I absolutely love this movie. This okay, is this great, is this great. is one of the favorites I think that maybe in the whole yeah. pod at least upon first watch obviously it takes a mm-hmm. few a few viewings and maybe a little time to really come to conclusions but mm-hmm. for me just I, I watched this movie um, yeah. just this morning before we, we were digging into this now and my first reaction I was just totally thrilled um, I, I thought I it had was a just, feeling I had a feeling you'd be into this one yeah I think I think something that I'm always kind of drawn to is this idea of um, characters kind of taking on other character roles within a story um and i and i love this little microcosm of this society set up on this island and how they all kind of play their roles within the society but also play their roles within the rituals Mm -hmm. um that they're getting into um and i also kind of like in carnival of souls which we which we recently talked about um this idea of the kind of fear and horror coming from just the existence of people and entities that we don't totally understand. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think what I, what I really enjoyed about this movie and why it feels like such a unique horror movie and such an inspiration, I think now, you know, having seen this, I can kind of see the through line to a lot of other horror films that I enjoy, um, yeah. is that it's, it's not really about scaring you constantly. It's kind of about just creating this underlying fear and mm-hmm. feeling that something scary is happening. It's but building. It's building, building something. But really nothing other than other than maybe a few scary images, I suppose. Mm-hmm. There, yeah. there's, a, there's a couple kind of grotesque images carried throughout. But yeah. it, there, there's nothing really for the first, you know, hour and 20 minutes <laughs> 20 of the minutes, movie. Probably, yeah. Like, that's actually scary. It's mostly just yeah. someone talking to people and investigating it's, a mystery. Exactly. Everything is under the surface almost, um, which was intentional. Um the, the writer of this film, uh, Anthony Schaefer, um, mm-hmm. he set out to write a non-conventional horror film. And he didn't want any blood, any gore, um, no jump scares or anything like that. Um, he just wanted to write a very unsettling, uh, haunting film, which I think he, he definitely accomplished. And this film is very influential. As you, as you mentioned, you, you see echoes of this film in, in many other horror films and many other films in general after it. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is just something so unsettling about the film and it's kind of hard to put into words in a way. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's you, definitely a little uncanny. 
Mm-hmm. But but it's, it doesn't it's unique. But it, but it's yeah. what's interesting about it is it doesn't feel. I suppose there is a little bit of a super. Actually, there's not really even. I guess there's a uh, little bit of a supernatural element. Mm, that, like, it could be implied, but yeah. yeah, like like there's one scene where the character Willow kind of seduces a guy <laughs> through a wall, through the wall. <laughs> um, which which I guess, but that's kind of the most supernatural thing. Which uh-huh. it really isn't. It's almost like witchcraft, but but not really. But yeah. but it isn't even totally supernatural because it's one of those things where you know someone could seduce someone by talking to them. It's it's not mm-hmm. totally outside. Of just well, the, she's singing, I guess. But, she, yeah, yeah, but she's singing. But it's not like like the way it's portrayed uh-huh. makes it feel like it's a little supernatural. But it's not mm-hmm. really an mm-hmm. unbelievable like, thing you know it's it's more avant-garde than that i, I feel like um, yeah and that, that's a great way to put it and i think that this movie either is kind of starting the tradition of or is in the vein of these kind of 70 70s mm-hmm. avant-garde horror films um mm-hmm. i know we we haven't talked about it on this podcast but we've kind of, it's kind of been brought up at times i believe is uh don't look now Yes, um, that movie was, came to I'm mind. Bring up later as well, yeah. Yeah, the te- and they're like and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, kind of this daylight mm-hmm. horror. Um, yep. And then a movie I actually haven't seen it, but I know it's been compared to this. I don't know if you've seen it, but Ari Aster's uh, Midsummer, which recently no, I, I guess I, don't, I guess it's not recently at this point. It came out about a year ago, but I know that that movie deals with kind of pagan ritual and is apparently mm-hmm. all set in in the daytime. So you do see kind of strains of this movie running through a lot of. American movies um, mm-hmm. that went on to be really successful horror films. Definitely. Um, and we've talked a lot about tone recently, Jeremy, mm-hmm. uh, with, with these films. And um, how would you describe the tone of this film? Because I, I got echoes of uh, like Hitchcock, a little mm-hmm. Hitchcock in there. <laughs> yeah. uh, a lot of like paranoia, kind of subjective filmmaking in there. Um, but w- I don't know, what was your takeaway from that? Yeah, I, th- I think Hitchcock is, is a good point of reference. Um, I don't know if it was intentional or not. Just kind of a vibe that I got. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where... I've also been watching a lot of Hitchcock lately. Yeah, well, I also think, you know, a filmmaker in 1974 making a psychological kind Mm -hmm. of thriller film inevitably will be drawing something from Hitchcock at at that... You know, it's kind of like how every filmmaker now, in one way or another, whether they're rejecting or accepting him, is probably influenced by a Quentin Tarantino Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's like, I feel like a Hitchcock in that time would have just been totally unavoidable for these filmmakers. Yeah. And also it, it's, it's kind of that, that twilight zone aspect as well. Yeah. It's like someone's in this very strange situation. Mm-hmm. Um, they're kind of the everyman character and they're kind of just plopped into uh, a certain scenario. And that's what this film is basically uh, for most of it. And uh, although the character is very interesting and I want to talk a little bit um about well we've touched on the plot a little bit but i want to talk about the acting in it because mm-hmm. um well first of all it takes place uh in scottish territory it's supposed to be a scott uh, a scottish island i believe mm-hmm. um although uh most of the cast is made up of brits so a lot of mm-hmm. british actors in this movie of course you mentioned uh of course the um the one <laughs> who comes to mind first christopher lee you yeah. know he's not the main character and actually doesn't show up until probably like an hour into the film mm-hmm. um but you know he's he's there and uh the main character uh he's played by um edward woodward mm-hmm. he's playing uh, sergeant howie and i thought he did a great job um because he's playing this as you mentioned a re- very religious straight-laced mm-hmm. police officer um and his character is he's kind of re- like the core of the film i feel like um because mm-hmm. a lot a lot is relying on him we are following him throughout the entire film yep. um and we're seeing everything almost from his perspective in a way mm-hmm. uh, which makes it somewhat more unsettling and, and more creepy i think yeah because um, he doesn't know it, it, it's because he has about, no idea yeah it, it, we, it's kind of like the classic humphrey bogart you yeah. know detective on a mystery and mm-hmm. we're, we're with him i think he's probably in pretty much every scene of the movie right I could Pretty be wrong about that, for but the most part, for the most yeah. part, there might be a few where he, he doesn't pop up, but for the most mm-hmm. part, he's in pretty much every single scene of this movie, and we're definitely seeing it through his perspective, mm-hmm. um, and I think what that does is it makes it so this idea of not knowing becomes so much more frightening, because as the audience, we're only getting the information he's getting, we're not getting exactly. anything else. Right, very subjective, right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, he was a trooper too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I was, you know, reading a lot about this movie, and I watched a, a making of and things like that. And so he's really in that Wicker Man structure at the end. Um, oh yeah. I'm not sure if everyone knows that, but he's actually not when they 
completely burn it down, obviously. But, but for a little uh, bit, he was up there. For a little bit, yeah. When there's there's some fire going, and he's in there, and mm-hmm. uh, there is a goat above him that urinates on him, apparently. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he was he was definitely uh, down for it, and I think I saw an interview with him where he was kind of like, yeah, you know, the things you do when you're in your 20s or whatever, you know, when you're younger. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that was also just a part of that 70s filmmaking, Jeremy, which I you, you um, touched on a little bit there. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like you know, the kind of go for broke attitude, the kind of rawness um, that you saw in a lot of these films, Mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, something that you don't necessarily see nowadays, but um, at that time it's, it's like everyone was kind of on that page, you know, everyone was kind of going for it in a way. Yeah. It does seem like there was a certain kind of fearlessness, particularly in seventies independent film. Yeah. um, Where like it was, it like you said, this kind of go for broke attitude where you would see these people just getting totally, invested and wrapped up in these films and kind of pushing the boundaries of Mm -hmm. where the film ended and where the like like where 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 the film story ended and where like the filmmaking story ended they kind of would like blur into each other a little bit Mm -hmm. um which you know obviously is a risky thing to do it's kind of a scary thing to do especially if we're talking about this situation you know if he's up in this wicker man structure he's probably in a little bit of real danger you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's, like, it's not a stuntman either. I mean, yeah. they had to see his face. So. Yeah, it's not a stunt, and, and, which gives it a certain, you know, like I think that's what makes that scene kind of so frightening. Mm-hmm. Um, is he's really up there, and there, there's mm-hmm. a thing where you like you're you seeing, can feel it. Yeah, you can feel the heat when he's in that. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't feel like a controlled stunt. It feels like mm-hmm. you're actually just watching this happen. Um, almost <laughs> exactly. And, you nailed and, it right and, there. Yeah. Yeah, and the look of this film to me, it's interesting. I just saw. I actually last night. Um, ended up at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, which just reopened. Oh. So anyone, any of our New York City listeners, or not New York City listeners, definitely <laughs> get there and check it out. They have a fantastic film department. Um, mm-hmm. But I saw this film called I Need a Ride to California, which is a Morris Engel film. He's the guy who directed a film called Little Fugitive, is what he's most known for. And it was actually the world premiere of the film, but the film came out in 1968 and had just been shelved. And it was a mm-hmm. fictional film that had this real documentary feel uh, that almost felt like kind of a D.A. Pennebaker kind of... Um, like music film, like a concert film or something like that, and the look and the and the feeling of it. And there's something about the Wicker Man that almost like like the camera work isn't really documentary style or anything like that. But it kind of the the whole thing has this feeling of like watching something real unfolding. It, it's kind of hard mm-hmm. to place exactly what it is. I don't know if it's just the look of the film that yeah. you know it has this kind of. 70s a little bit faded look to it that almost makes it feel like a lost artifact um mm-hmm. maybe it is something that has to do with the fact that it is as you know this is our one hit wonder series robin hardy never really created another hit film he really didn't direct too many films at all i think no, he, he only, only did two or three films one of those yeah. being um the wicker tree which came out in 2011 and did not yeah. really take off at all um no. so so i think that maybe part of it is that it wasn't you know, there were so many of these big auteurs in the 70s who made all these... Yeah, so he only directed three films. He did The Wicker Man, mm-hmm. The Fantasist, Fantasist, The Fantasist, mm-hmm. and The Wicker Tree. And I think, and you I know... I think he wrote one other one. Yeah, yeah and he wrote... Um, I have it. He wrote a couple up. novels, actually. He wrote... Um, the Bull Dance, the, he wrote the story for. He wrote the novelization of this film, I believe, and he also wrote mm-hmm. uh, a novel... Uh, which was the basis for the Wicker Tree when he eventually made that, which yeah. I found interesting. Yeah. Um, so he was, I guess, productive, but we didn't really. He was productive, but you know, yeah. he wasn't a Scorsese, he wasn't a Spielberg, no, no. he wasn't a De Palma. Which is why we're talking about, talking about him here. <laughs> but I, but I think yeah. the fact that there isn't as much scholarship on this film, it, it kind of doesn't get looked at as critically as a lot of those other big '70s films do. Yeah. Kind of gives it, it that artifact feel. Why do you think that is? Do you think it's because it's so, I don't know, British or I'm not, I don't know, I'm not sure what it is about it. That just, I, I don't know. Cause it's definitely it's renowned. Like people talk, yeah. I mean, this is, this film gets referred to as the, uh, I believe was it the, the citizen Kane of horror films. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's definitely well regarded. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely highly regarded, but it's one of those things where I don't know. It doesn't seem, I mean to get, cause I love seventies film and the fact that like mm-hmm. I hadn't seen this until now, you mm-hmm. know, I think is probably a testament to the fact that it somehow flies under the radar a little bit. Yeah. I mean, also maybe it's a subject matter. I mean, it tackles mm-hmm. some pretty, some pretty heady things, some pretty like almost abstract uh, concepts. Yeah. So obviously, the the main plot it starts off about a missing girl, mm-hmm. which is why Sergeant Howie goes to this island in the first place is to find this girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- right off the bat, there's something kind of odd, you know, something kind of strange about these 
the people that make up the inhabitants of the island, but uh, nothing, you know, it's kind of like a, they have a joyful song in the, in the pub and mm -hmm. they're all singing along. And so they're, they're strange, but he's kind of like, okay, well, I'm just going to kind of do my own thing. Yeah. They're just, he, they're just people who live on an island and they eat a lot of fruit. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. They're, <laughs> they're locals. Yeah. So, um, but you know, as he starts to look into things more, that's when the horror starts I think when the horror begins is because it's that creeping feeling of like something is not right here. Something's going on. Mm -hmm. What is it? You know, and, and that's what the movie becomes about. Um, and it also becomes, like I said, about this main character, um, Sergeant Howie. And also the clashing of religions is a big thing. I mean, worshiping the old gods, pagan rituals that takes a obviously it's a big, big part of the film. Um, but also it's about different ideologies and different moral codes and and how these things um, you know how they conflict and how they come together and mm -hmm. and um, I guess having two uh, opposing points of view that are very strong and um, so you know because he the main character sees the inhabitants of this island as essentially savages yeah like bar yeah I think he calls them barbarians at one point or something like that like mm -hmm. heathens you know um, so he looks down on them uh, for for most of the film well yeah for once he realizes what's going on he, he definitely looks down on them um, but that brings up a topic I wanted to ask you about, Jeremy. It's um, it's probably it's a big question. Do you think there's a message to this film, either regarding morality or religion, or is it simply the backdrop of a suspenseful horror film? And I, I ask this because not only was it something I was thinking about when I was watching it this time, but I've seen this question posed before. Um, I think it was on Twitter actually, mm -hmm. and I don't remember who the person was, um, to be honest. But they said something along the lines of, "Are we, as the audience, meant to truly empathize with this main character?" She found the person <laughs> yeah, very boring, like stick in the mud or like mm -hmm. a wet blanket, something like that. Yeah. Um, which is funny, but I think it also brings up a good point and and possibly debate about how one views this film. Yeah. Like, are we supposed to? be rooting for him are we supposed to you know it, it's it's kind of a hard question and in some ways it's cut and dry in some ways it's like of course we are but also yeah. it's like you know uh, he's so he's so strict about his morals and his and everything has to be his way and mm -hmm. you know and i guess it's also comes down to how you view certain organized religions and things like that but so it's kind of a big question but i just wanted to get your take on on what you think about that yeah personally i i feel that um there's a couple things that play into that and time kind of changes that because I think coming out in in the early 1970s, the you know you know these days we see all kinds of things on film that um, would would back in the day be considered kind of blasphemous um, to someone who was religious and um, the world in that era was at least the Christian world I think was a lot more uh, driven by kind of old world religious principles. Um, which is why I think we saw a lot of these kind of horror movies. An example would be like a Rosemary's Baby, um, yeah. where the horror is this idea of devil worship or paganism or or something mm -hmm. kind of other. Um, mm -hmm. And but I think what makes this one so I, I think in one sense um, making him this this Christian character was a way for the filmmakers to bring in those people. Um, I, I think that that was a way to make him relatable in the era. But what I think is so interesting about it is he not only to me was he kind of a because I don't want to use the word dull character, but compared to the other characters on the island, he's not as much yeah. fun to spend time with. Like what makes this movie fun? He doesn't is, sing at all. <laughs> he doesn't sing. He doesn't you know do any weird yeah. dances. He, you know right. he's pretty straightforward. <laughs> no dude. masks or anything. Well, actually, he does put on a mask. He does put on a mask, but only he doesn't put on a mask because it's it's fun and part of his ritual. Yeah. <laughs> but but what I think what I think makes it kind of interesting is that he's so rigid in his religious beliefs that I would say he's as rigid as they are. Um, right. Which, which I think is what, what I really like about this film, and at least my personal interpretation, I don't know too much about the director or the writer's religious beliefs, yeah. so I don't want to comment I, on I was, them. Yeah, I wasn't able to find really anything about that. Yeah, so I, I don't want to comment on them, but like what I would kind of pull from it is this idea, and this particularly when they're at the end and he's screaming at them about, you know, what yeah. if it doesn't work? There, there is a certain logic to what he's saying when he's screaming at them at the end. When he's in this structure and it's being burnt, he's screaming to them, this will not bring back your crops. This will not solve your issues, you know? So in, and there's, in that sense, it's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think it's just a takedown so. of paganism. I think it's, it's a takedown of, mm -hmm. I don't want to say just organized religion, but of kind of mm -hmm. like organized right. groups and rigid rules in general because he's screaming at but them saying... that disparity because... 
Yeah, I, 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 I see. That's why it's hard because there is. Yeah. I totally, I, I totally get what you're saying, but well, and the, the fact thing that, that our main character is a, a Christian, very Christian man. I mean, <laughs> it's yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard to pin down, and and it's hard to say if they did have a message or if it's just yeah. this, the way the story went. I mean, and maybe you're supposed to make up your own mind about that. Well, I'm and really I think sure. what 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 makes it interesting and why at least in my my reading of it. I would say that it is kind of a takedown of all of it is that he's being so rigid and he's screaming at them about being rigid, saying it's not going to do anything. But mm-hmm. meanwhile, the thing that's even right. put him in this position is his own religious rigidity. If he yeah. had just gone and slept with the woman, it wouldn't have been a problem. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly, if, if, yeah. if he hadn't it's, it's been... It's kind of like eye for an eye in a way. It's yeah. Like, what, if if he hadn't thinking. been so passionate about his, you know, kind of religious savior complex. You know what I mean? Because I think at a certain point, it's not just about saving this girl. You know what I mean? I, I, I think no, for him, it, it's kind of about like, oh, these people are savages. I need to show them the good Christian way. And it, so if, yeah. he had, if he hadn't been so rigid in his thing, he wouldn't have ended up having the tragic fate he did, which I think kind of plays at the fact that like, as a viewer, I don't know if we're really supposed to relate to either like him or this group of people. Right. I think it's kind right. of supposed to point out that either way, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like in any situation, letting yeah. any one system of morals dictate every decision you make above your own observations and your own Mm -hmm. feelings towards humanity um that that is what's supposed to be ridiculous not paganism not christianity but the whole thing right it's almost like we're the objective viewer just watching both these Mm -hmm. ideologies clash um in a way and yeah i mean the the meaning behind this film, I, I think it's a debate that's going to be ongoing, mm-hmm. um, especially with time, like you said, like looking back on it, you know, you, you see different things. But yeah. uh, to, to me, I've always viewed The Wicker Man as all about the fear that comes from from being isolated, you know, the fear of what you don't understand. Mm-hmm. And like you said, Jeremy, the fear of the other. Um, yeah. That's what this when I think of this film, that's mostly what I do think of um, in terms of of tone and things like that mm-hmm. or th- in terms of what they were trying to get across. So. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, because it, there, there is this kind of thing where obviously in the end we find out he was right, you know, basically, mm-hmm. and they were doing some sinister things. Yeah. But there is, yeah, yeah, there isn't really anything that gives him hard proof that anything sinister is going on until right. the very end. And until that very, yeah. you know what I mean? And so there is that kind of thing with like the other, um, particularly in the world we're living in now where there's, kind of so much polarization of ideas and you know when we talk about like immigration this fear of immigrants coming into the united states and causing crimes or anything like that and and, and any anything where there's kind of one group who either doesn't understand another or has fear of another will kind of start to project onto them and start to he thinks yeah he starts to make them thinks he's doing the right thing and yeah it's like part of this film is like also about how trying to do what you think is right, mm-hmm. like the right thing, you know, how that can ultimately lead to an unfortunate ending, which yeah. he, he clearly has. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to, to kind of unpack there. And that's why mm-hmm. I think it's such an interesting and lasting film as well, because yeah. um, there is so much there. Um, but then you also have, like, things in it that um, <laughs> I definitely want to touch on this because uh, we talk about a lot of cult films here. And, it's you know, the things we've said so far, it's it wouldn't lead you to think this is really a cult film. But I think there's mm-hmm. certain aspects of it. Oh, yeah. Um, for one, well, I mentioned Christopher Lee is in it, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, who apparently agreed to do this for free. Um, yes. I saw him say in, in an interview say that, um, which is believable because this was a, a fairly low budget film. And apparently he really believed in it. Mm-hmm. Um, he also considers it to be one of his greatest roles and like maybe one of his favorite films that he's ever been in. Which I would agree. Uh, I mean, I haven't seen too much Christopher Lee stuff. But yeah. from what I've seen, I, th- I think, you know, I think I think he was terrific it's, in this movie. Yeah, he's, I was going to, you know, at first I was going to call it a, a hammy role. Like, you know, he's known for doing really hamming it up in his roles. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really think this is actually pretty tastefully done and yeah. not as over the top as it could have been for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, so there's that aspect of it. Also, the music, I feel like, kind of brings it into that more cult territory yeah. as well. Because there's a lot of it is, I guess, uh, traditional folk songs that have been reinterpreted and also a, cu- a couple of original songs, I believe, as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and kind of brings it to a different surreal level. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned that scene where the woman, I, I forget her name, but she's in the Willow? hotel. Yeah, Willow. Because yeah. um, I think it's called Willow Song, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he's in that when he checks into the inn and he's in the bedroom, I think he's like praying or something like that, mm-hmm. saying his prayers. And uh, she is calling out to him through song. 
uh, through the wall, basically, and she's singing this song to him, and and she's completely nude. It's it's definitely one of the stranger musical yeah. scenes I think I've ever seen in in a movie. And the song is uh, terrific, though. That, that's a that's a great yeah, it's song. A great, yeah, and the music is I think all around is pre- is pretty well done in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, the musical moments uh, were something that when I rewatched it this time, I had completely forgotten about them for the most part. I remember yeah. that one part, but yeah, I forgot just how much music there is in the film. And I think the director actually joked to the crew like halfway through, like, Oh, by the way, we're making a musical. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, Which they kind of we were, were making a horror film. Yeah. Yeah. They kind of were. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a horror movie, but it's also, it has these like playful and silly moments to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess that scene in particular where she's nude singing through the wall, I guess it's meant to show the, the temptation that mm-hmm. Sergeant Howie is continually fighting against in this movie. Well, it's kind of like the classic um, idea of the siren, you know, the, mm-hmm. the historically we'd see the siren character. Yeah. It's, it's a bit of a trope. And I guess that's kind yeah. of what she's supposed to. Right. Represent. And it also goes with the theme of fertility and rebirth, mm-hmm. cleansing of sin and all that. Yeah. Um, but what did you think about the music, how it was used in the film? You, you know, did you think it worked pretty well? Yeah, I thought it worked the, really well, actually. I, Cause I think it's one of those things where just watching it through as, as I was watching it, the song, the music, it didn't really seem even like a musical to me. It just kind of seemed like there are these people who are an agricultural people and they kind of use song to pass the time. Um, but now like thinking about it and talking to you about it, I realized how it wasn't just that it, it really played in more. The music really kind of carried certain moments. Um, and it, it was more than just kind of like a whistle while you work thematic yeah, thing. It wasn't like, okay, now we're going to do a song. It was like, yeah. uh, this is all part of the world that he's in now. Yeah. This island that he's living on. Which I think adds yeah. to kind of that eerie feeling of it. You yeah. know, it's like, it's like it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a normal world, yet they sing, you know, mm-hmm. and, and they play music. And, and there's also this really interesting thing that would happen too, which I really loved, where it seemed like, um, and there were a couple moments of this, once in the scene with the seduction, but I think earlier on there was... And there might even be more than just the ones I've kind of noticed and pointed out here, um, where someone will be playing music or singing music on one part of the island, and someone else on the other side of the island or in another location will kind of be singing or tapping along or kind of interacting with the music as if they were right there listening to it, but they're nowhere near it, which kind of adds to this like supernatural feeling, but in a really subtle way where like we as an audience might not even really question it, but it's Mm -hmm. very bizarre. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, just, like if you saw yeah, if you saw a movie yeah. and there was a band playing a concert and someone in another location in another scene happened to yeah. be playing the same music at the same time, you'd be like, "Oh, that's a <laughs> weird, stupid coincidence." Yeah. But like it's, in this, it, it's seamless. It's totally seamless. Mm-hmm. And it's showing in a very subtle way that these these people are different than him, and they're all on their own wavelength. You know, and he's he's the outsider. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's yeah, there's different techniques used throughout the film that I, that I think build and the surreal quality of it starts to build and, and become more and more. And I think once we see those animal masks, I feel like mm-hmm. the film kind of is it officially getting to that next realm. Yeah. And I always found, you know, those, those animal masks that they start to wear, I always found them very creepy and unsettling. And one of the, th- the first things I would think about when I thought of this movie, because that always creeped me out uh, mm-hmm. when I first saw it, there's something oddly menacing about j- these just very blank faced animal masks that they wear, mm-hmm. which I know is part of the ritual as well, but it just, it adds so much to that horror aspect, I think. Yeah. And I think you see that in a lot of films now today. I mean, obviously there's like, the uh you know the the huge examples of like jason from friday the 13th and yeah. all that but i i think even now like i think i haven't seen it but the strangers i believe yeah uh they use masks and that like just kind of like those the blank purge. masks yeah yeah exactly like there's you see a lot of that now even in dark night like the joker use a mask and things like that so yeah. you see that pop up a lot and that might just be like might be like a um you know something that's just like lurking underneath like humanity just like has this this fear of masks or something yeah. that I'm not sure but I think it's like um, a fear of the uncanny like w- when you don't yeah, know what's behind it you don't know if you can trust you it or not you don't know what's there exactly um, and I think that's a huge part of this film as well. yeah it's interesting I, and it's it, it's even like like I mean as we're talking about the influence um I, I recently just watched the movie Child's Play somehow for the first time I <laughs> okay, managed yeah. to avoid it for years and years and <laughs> I I found that the Chucky doll was way more scary when mm-hmm. he was just a cute little Chucky doll. Like, as soon as he became, like, the evil Chucky, he, he, he yeah. kind of, like, took some of the mystery out and it became more of a thriller. But when he was just, like, uh-huh. this cute little doll, it was horrifying. Yeah. Uh, the movie that this th- these masks actually called to mind 
for me more than anything else and the way they were shot and everything was eyes wide shut um yeah which is interesting because i feel like a Kub- like kubrick it, it very rarely gets talked about who influenced him mm-hmm. you know what i mean like like it's it's even though you you can find little flashes of other people's work in kubrick's movies it generally mm-hmm. you know i don't know if it's just a cultural thing and that's how we've builds it up but it seems like he's just this mad genius who comes up with every idea on his own and just executes it and it's perfect um but the way the masks were shot with kind of these these long um static glaring shots of these characters where you're not even sure if they're looking at the camera or at the character you know kind of very still maybe a little dutch and crooked shooting from kind of a low angle i think really is almost exactly how kubrick shot some of those big um cult scenes in Eyes Wide Shut, mm-hmm. yeah. um, which I think, I, you know, I'm pretty damn sure he would have seen this movie. Um, Probably. <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it seems like he in that era, he, you know, he was pretty into avant-garde film, um, actually very into avant-garde film. I know he was a huge fan of like Eraserhead and a bunch of other kind of out there movies, and which mm-hmm. makes sense because his movies were pretty out there despite the fact that they were big Hollywood events. Um, right. And I don't know, like, tonally, I really think that this movie um, has a, is, is kind of, in a weird way, almost a companion piece to An Eyes Wide Shut. You know, you have yeah. this outsider coming in to a, a civilization of people who he doesn't necessarily understand, kind of wanting to be part of it, but also kind of wanting to break it down. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, like, almost nothing happens. Mm-hmm. But it's still frightening because there's this underlying fear that he's getting into something that's above his head. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I know that Eyes Wide Shut was adapted, I believe, from a story. I think it's called like Trumnaveil or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I don't know the the way the way the the cinematic language is constructed between the two movies. I think has some real parallels, which is kind of interesting because, like I said, you know Kubrick, he, he he's kind of known as the you know the grand genius who is always innovating yeah. and always doing it first, but. I think he definitely. I don't really want to say yeah. definitely because I don't have any documentation proving it. Mm-hmm. But I would. I would venture to say that he pulled a little bit from this movie. Yeah, I mean, The Wicker Man was incredibly influential, which we've touched on before, and I. I think it's certainly true. And I think um, the more you like, once you see this film, and then you start to think about other films, you mm-hmm. you, you definitely see it. Like even um, Hot Fuzz uh, apparently was influenced yeah. by this film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can which totally is a see comedy, it. but yeah. Um, yeah, you can definitely see elements of it there. Yeah. Um, but it's all, it's all over the the British uh, comedy troupe uh, League of Gentlemen. I don't know if you know about them, but mm-hmm. they're they're interesting because um, they're a comedy troupe that's very influenced by horror films, particularly. 70s 80s uh british horror films Mm -hmm. um and one of their recurring skits is um is very influenced by the wicker man when he first goes into that pub and is confronted by all these strange people you know it's the the townsfolk Mm -hmm. um they have a recurring sketch that's sort of like that so it's you know this movie is just very even though it's it's it was very under the radar when it came out, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, it did go on to be, you know, very much a cult film, um, and part of that is due to the imagery and also the ending. I definitely want to talk about that ending, that mm-hmm. last scene. Um, so, story-wise, eventually by the end of the film, and this is essentially the very end of the film. Um, it's a pretty short film. It's it's, it's a slim hour hour and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, so Lord Summer Isle, who is played by um, Christopher Lee, who's like the ruler of this <laughs> island, I guess. Um, he tells Sergeant Howie, that the missing girl, Rowan, was never the intended sacrifice and that Howie himself is. Mm -hmm. And he fits all the the requirements that the the old gods have. You know, he came of his own free will. He has the power of a king, I guess because he's a a police officer representing the law. Um, Mm -hmm. He's a virgin and he is apparently a fool. Mm -hmm. Um, So those four things. Well, I think um, he wears the fool costume. He does. He's the fool. fool. You know, he's literally the fool. Right, and they view him as a fool as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that all culminates, and the, the, the whole film, really, every scene culminates in that final scene, uh, that, that ending. And I feel like, like I said before, like I feel like the film is building to that scene, um, that final image. And um, in fact, you don't see the actual Wicker Man structure itself until that last scene, until like there's only a few shots left. Mm-hmm. Um, and that scene to me is one of the greatest set pieces in all of horror films, mm-hmm. and I would say if, even in cult film. Um, the fact, like we said, that the actor is actually in there, it does add to it uh, as it starts to be set ablaze and there's animals in there, which apparently were not hurt. 
did look into that. Yes. That's what they're that's what they're claiming anyway. Hopefully. <laughs> um, and yeah, it seems it seems to check out. But um, anyway, so yeah, there's a very there's a rawness to that scene. There's that imagery is is undeniable. Um, just that wicker structure going up in flames with the man inside while these uh, inhabitants of the island are chanting around him and singing. It's uh, it's so bizarre and <laughs> also what the film is is like i said what it leads up to um mm-hmm. and uh, as we discussed it's part of that kind of go for broke nature of the 70s um and it, but also it really is just that scene it, it truly is a nightmare and yeah this film this film feels like a nightmare and by the end of it when that structure goes down when it is demolished by the the fire and you see the setting sun i mean you mm-hmm. just feel like you just had like you just woke up from a dream or something yeah it just it has that feel to it yeah. Um, but how you know how do you how do you view that last scene? Did you feel affected by it or? Yeah, I thought I thought it was just totally overwhelming. Um, it, it's one. Did of those you know things... that was coming? Because I, I know you hadn't seen it, but did you know I, that was like I, I, it was all leading? I I didn't know exactly what it would be. I had seen the image of this giant burning man. Um, you figured there was a wicker man at some point, probably. <laughs> yeah, it, it's one of those things where you know. I mean, if you type in the wicker man, nineteen seventy three on the internet, the first image that comes up is the it's wicker man. You know what I mean? So it's not the kind of thing you can really avoid, yeah. but like, I didn't know what context it would be in. Um, and I kind of honestly, as I was going through the movie, forgot about it. I really knew going into this, I did not know what this movie was about at all. I had no idea. Like I, like I, yeah. I, I really, like I, I went out of my way to avoid knowing what it was about. Um, so like, you know, in the first, 15 or 20 minutes of the film, that image was kind of in my mind. I thought, oh, maybe we'll see this like halfway through and it'll be some kind of like, you know, some kind of ritual, but maybe they're like praying to this sculpture. Or, you know what I mean? I didn't think that it would end yeah. up being the death device. Right. Um, and which and the, film just, the film just ends there too. It it's just not ends, like there's, yeah. a, there's no bumper at the end or, you know, that's just it. And which I, which I that, love. I, I love when yeah, movies, I think that's, they get in that's and they what get makes out. It. Yeah, exactly. And this movie is pretty short and sweet. Um, and But part of that is due to the fact that it was heavily cut, um, mm-hmm. which I want to talk about a little bit, because I think it's important to this film actually becoming a cult film in some ways. Um, so the producers of this film, uh, British Lion Films, they were not believers in this film <laughs> when it was when they saw the final cut of it they they wanted to put a happy ending on there as studios usually do um and they which i think and uh, rightfully you know the the crew and the the director and writer of this film were very adamant that they would not change the ending of the film because that completely ruins the movie um so they did not change it and so they did release the film but the studio released it sort of under the radar they mm-hmm. released it as a dub- double bill with a movie that you actually mentioned earlier, Jeremy, uh, Don't Look Now. Oh, yeah? I didn't which, even realize that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. which is another, I, I think, a, a really good uh, British Yeah, that would, be, that would be a really overwhelming, overwhelming double bill to sit and watch in yeah. one night. That would be a really, yeah. really intense two, experience. Yeah, two wildly different uh, British horror films uh, that I think are both, yeah, really great cult films as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, thinking about it now, it's like, that's that's awesome. But yeah. <laughs> at the time, the the makers of, of this film were obviously, I'm sure, bummed out by the mm-hmm. fact that they were getting just released as a, a double bill. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of went under the radar. It was released, and that was it. Um, and then years later, as most mostly happens with these cult films, people began to rediscover it. And it, I think that the fact that it was uh, released that way actually helped it because then it became more of like a, you know, people had to seek it out and yeah. it became this dangerous film that people wanted to find and, mm-hmm. and they had heard of something about it. So that kind of added to the mystique of it. And I think it actually ended up helping it in a lot of yeah. ways. And Which is the case did, for a lot of films we've talked about. Exactly. In yeah. the series. And, right. Definitely. Um, and once it was discovered, obviously it was very influential and, and all of that. Um, and that uh, the ending has a big thing to do with it, I think. And so mm-hmm. I'm really glad they didn't change that, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I think cinema would be quite different if they had. Um, and we do want to mention there was... So Ro- Robin Hardy, um, as we mentioned, did not direct much besides this film. Mm-hmm. He did direct The Wicker Tree in, in 2011, which is a sort of a spiritual successor to this film, a companion piece, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and he actually did intend to make a third film, which would close out his quasi trilogy. Um, but he unfortunately passed away before he could do that. Um, so I have not seen the wicker tree and uh, you said you haven't seen it as well. So yeah. I'm not sure where that stands. Um, 
I, I haven't seen much about it. Like, I don't know if it has any cred or anything like that. I mean, maybe that's one of those movies that will be discovered later as well. Yeah, I know uh, that it I wasn't would... particularly well reviewed when it came okay. out. Um, but, yeah. but, you know, that doesn't mean was, anything. Yeah, I mean, I was interested to check it out just because it was yeah. the same director and he had mm-hmm. written the story for it and everything like that. So mm-hmm. I was curious and I might I may still watch it at some point. Um, and of course, there was the remake, mm-hmm. uh, which came out in 2006. Correct. It starred Nicolas Cage. Um, and so where is this film? I know I have not seen that movie, uh, but mm-hmm. obviously you can't go on YouTube and type in The Wicker Man without uh, a ridiculous scene of, <laughs> yeah. of Nicolas Cage popping up uh, from this movie where, you know, how to get burned or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So the bees, not the bees. <laughs> yeah, not the bees. Because uh, apparently, you know, in this film, the, the main character is a virgin and very straight laced Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the remake, I believe he's scared of bees. I think that's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you they know. replaced it with that, that's what I heard anyway. I'm not well, sure. Well, the, the exactly remake true. it was I believe was PG thirteen. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. yeah it, they, it was, it was they, in that mid two thousands stretch of just, a lot of PG thirteen horror movies coming out yeah. where they uh-huh. were kind of being consumed. Uh, they, they on think a large I think they scale. changed. Um, they changed apples to honey as well. Like the crops that were apples in, the, in this film were, were changed to honey. I think yeah. that's something to do. With I don't know. I but anyway, <laughs> so yeah, I, exactly. Uh, the scenes I did see, he, uh, Nicholas Cage punches a lot of people in the face though. That was mm-hmm. one thing I noticed. So that, I mean, Hey, it, it seems like a different kind of cult film, yeah. um, which I would probably actually enjoy. And on a certain level, um, not anywhere near what this film is, but mm-hmm. maybe as a, uh, a can't be, uh, that might've like, fit into our so bad. It's good series. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think we are going to have to do a, a, probably at least a second part to that one. Um, although, we have lots of other although there is something to be said about a film and its remake, both being cult films. And yeah, it's kind of interesting so, and so vastly different. <laughs> so too, vastly I mean. different. Yeah. For very um, different reasons. Cause that movie is pretty notorious actually. As yeah. Being just like a really, like they were not on the right path with that. No. <laughs> like, and they, they made it anyway. So it's one of those. Um, so yeah, I, I might check it out at some point, but, mm. um, but yeah, this film, uh, the 1973, uh, British horror film, the wicker man, I think one of the all time classic horror films of all time. And, uh, yeah, I think it really holds up mm-hmm. and, um, I guess, was there anything else you wanted to, uh, to say about this film, Jeremy? No, no. I mean, like I said, I, I mean, I've only watched this once. I watched it today. But upon mm-hmm. first viewing, I was totally, totally immersed yeah. in all about this movie. I thought it was an awesome, awesome horror movie experience. Well, wait a few years and watch it again because yeah. it'll still be good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's going to do it for this episode of Cult Movie Cult. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. If you have any cult films you'd like to hear us discuss on the show, or if you'd like to join the cult and be a guest on the show, please reach out to us at cultmoviecult at gmail.com. This has been Cult Movie Cult, and until next time, so long from the other side.